4.1 1. The film is set in 13th century Scotland. Mel Gibson plays the Scottish rebel William Wallace, who tries to overthrow the English who ruled Scotland at that time. One of the most memorable scenes is the Battle of Stirling, when Wallace's army, hopelessly outnumbered, wait in an open field for the English to attack. The English fire thousands of arrows into the air, but the Scots defend themselves with shields. Then the English knights on horseback charge at full speed, but at the last moment the Scottish troops raise their spears and the English knights are thrown from their horses and slaughtered. A fierce battle then takes place and Wallace's army are victorious. The scene is not a model of historical accuracy, but with its spectacular special effects and stunts, it's tremendous fun. They may take our lives, but they will never take our freedom! 2. Gone with the Wind is based on the best-selling book by Margaret Mitchell. It tells the story of a manipulative woman, Scarlett O'Hara, played by Vivian Lee, and an unscrupulous man, Rhett Butler, Clark Gable, who carry on a turbulent love affair in the American South during the Civil War. The Confederates, the side Scarlett's family supports, are losing, and Scarlett is living in Atlanta, which is besieged by the Union Army. She escapes and goes home, only to find her mother dead, her father disoriented, and her family home looted. She asks for food, and is told the soldiers have taken everything. In this dramatic scene, Scarlet, starving and desperate, suddenly sees a turnip in the ground. She falls on it, pulls it from the ground, and eats it. She is nearly sick, then rises from the ground, looks round the ruined land and vows, as God is my witness, I'll never be hungry again. 3. This epic film tells the story of the rise and fall of a slave in the Roman Empire. Spartacus, Kirk Douglas, is trained as a gladiator, but he rebels against his Roman owner and escapes. He forms an army of slaves and becomes their leader. Although they have fewer weapons and are less well organised, they win several victories against the Roman forces which are sent to put down the rebellion. But a final climactic battle just outside Rome results in the total defeat of the rebel army, with heavy casualties on both sides and the capture of many of the survivors, including Spartacus. Crassus, Laurence Olivier, the Roman general, promises the captives that they will not be punished if they will identify Spartacus. In this powerful scene, one by one, each surviving soldier stands and shouts out, I'm Spartacus. Crassus finally condemns them all to be executed in a mass crucifixion along the Appian Way. 4.2 Captive, captor, captive, capture. Civilization, civilian, civil, civilized, civilize. Execution, executioner, execute. History, historian, historical, historic. Looting, looter, loot. Rebellion, rebel, rebellious, rebel. Siege, besiege. Survival, survivor, surviving, survive. Withdrawal, withdraw. Victory, victor. Victorious. 4.3 In the book History Goes to the Movies, the author, Joseph Rockmore, gives films stars according to their historical accuracy on a one to five scale. Five stars means a film's very accurate and no stars means it's very inaccurate. I'm going to look at two of the best known films that Rockmore features in his book. 
The first film is the Oscar-winning movie Titanic, which was directed by James Cameron in 1997. The film is historically accurate as regards the events leading up to the collision with the iceberg. The Titanic was sailing too fast, and the captain ignored warnings about ice. The collision and sinking are also very accurately portrayed with amazing special effects. However, where the film falls down is in its characterization. I must say I entirely agree with Rockmore when he criticises director James Cameron for what he calls class-conscious overkill. What he means by that is Cameron depicts all the third-class passengers in the film as brave and good, and all the first-class passengers as selfish, stupid, cowardly, or downright evil. And this can't have been the case. Then, a large part of the film centres on the love story between Jack, a third-class passenger, played by Leo DiCaprio, and Rose, a first-class passenger, played by Kate Winslet. Obviously, these characters and their story are fictitious, and were just added, presumably, to sell the film to a younger audience. But many historians have pointed out that a romance between Jack and Rose is totally improbable, because at that time there was complete class segregation on board ship. Rockmore also criticises the film's portrayal of Captain Smith. He's made out to be indecisive and, frankly, useless throughout the disaster, but this contradicts everything which was said about him by survivors of the sinking. And for me, though, even more indefensible was the film's portrayal of the ship's first officer, William Murdoch. On the night of the sinking, he behaved heroically. In his hometown in Scotland, there's even a memorial to him, but in the film, he's shown taking a bribe from a passenger in exchange for a place in a lifeboat, shooting passengers dead, and finally shooting himself in the head. In fact, the film company 20th Century Fox, who produced Titanic, were eventually forced to admit that there was no historical evidence that Murdoch did any of these things, and that they'd included these details purely and simply to make the story more interesting. Rockmore gives Titanic three stars, describing it as great pyrotechnics, mediocre history. All in all, I think his assessment is about right. The main events are true, but the characterisation is definitely the weak point in the film. Moving on to the second film, Braveheart. This is one of the films to which Rockmore gives five stars for historical accuracy. He gives the film five stars because despite what he calls some small fictions, he thinks Braveheart is, I quote, true to the spirit of William Wallace. Well, that may be the case, but I'm afraid I have to take exception to the phrase small fictions. The historian Elizabeth Ewan described Braveheart as a film which almost totally sacrifices historical accuracy for epic adventure. William Wallace is portrayed as a kind of poor, primitive tribesmen living in a village. In fact, he was the son of a rich landowner, and he later became a knight. You'll remember too that in the film, Mel Gibson wears woad, a kind of blue face paint. Apparently, the Scots stopped wearing woad hundreds of years earlier. And while we're on the subject of costume, in the film, the Scottish soldiers wear kilts, no surprises there, you might think, but in the 13th century, which is when the events of the film are set, the Scots did not wear kilts, and in fact they didn't start wearing them until four centuries later. Another of these fictions is that in Braveheart, William Wallace has a romance with the beautiful French princess, Isabel. However, the historical reality is that Wallace never met Isabel, and even if he had, she would only have been nine years old at the time. Finally, anyone who's seen the film will remember the famous battle scene. The battle was the Battle of Stirling, so-called because it was fought on Stirling Bridge in Scotland. Basically, the reason why the Scots won the battle is because the English soldiers got trapped on the narrow bridge. In Braveheart, the bridge does not appear at all in the battle. In fact, Mel Gibson originally planned to film the scene on the actual bridge, but he found that the bridge kept getting in the way. Apparently, when he mentioned this to one of the Scottish history advisers on the film, the man's reply was, Aye, that's what the English found. Mel Gibson defended all the inaccuracies in the film, saying that the film's version of history was more compelling cinematically. 
Admittedly, it is a very entertaining film, and it does give you a strong feeling for William Wallace and how he must have inspired his countrymen. But I don't think you can give this film five stars or even two stars for historical accuracy. Four point four. One. Obviously, these characters and their story are fictitious. Two. All in all, I think his assessment is about right. Three. William Wallace is portrayed as a kind of poor, primitive tribesman living in a village. In fact, he was the son of a rich landowner. Four. Apparently, the Scots stopped wearing woad hundreds of years earlier. Five. Basically, the reason why the Scots won the battle is because the English soldiers got trapped on the narrow bridge. Four point five. One. Would you mind opening the window? It's a bit stuffy in here. Two. To Victoria Station. And can you hurry, please? Three. Could you do me a favour? I need someone to help me with this report. Four. If you're going to the canteen, do you think you could get me a sandwich? Five. Would you mind asking your parents to come next weekend and not this one? Six. Could you possibly give me a lift to the station? My car's being serviced. Four point six. One. A. Would you mind opening the window? It's a bit stuffy in here. B. Would you mind opening the window? It's a bit stuffy in here. Two. A. To Victoria Station. And can you hurry, please? B. To Victoria Station. And can you hurry, please? Three. A. Could you do me a favour? I need someone to help me with this report. B. Could you do me a favour? I need someone to help me with this report. Four. A. If you're going to the canteen, do you think you could get me a sandwich? B. If you're going to the canteen, do you think you could get me a sandwich? Five. A. Would you mind asking your parents to come next weekend and not this one? B. Would you mind asking your parents to come next weekend and not this one? Six. A. Could you possibly give me a lift to the station? My car's being serviced. B. Could you possibly give me a lift to the station? My car's being serviced. Four point seven. One. Would you mind opening the window? It's a bit stuffy in here. Two. To Victoria Station. And can you hurry, please? Three. Could you do me a favour? I need someone to help me with this report. Four. If you're going to the canteen, do you think you could get me a sandwich? Five. Would you mind asking your parents to come next weekend and not this one? Six. Could you possibly give me a lift to the station? My car's being serviced. Four point eight. Hello. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's edition of the book program. Did you know that in every list of bestsellers, there's always one kind of book that's guaranteed to be there, and that's a self-help book. From how to make a fortune to how to bring up your children, there's a book that can give you advice on any problem you might possibly have. Today, our four contributors have each chosen a best-selling self-help book to talk about. First, Matt Crossley. What did you choose, Matt? Well, I have quite a few friends who are into psychology, 
And when I'm chatting to them, I always wish I could make an intelligent comment, which <laughs> would show that I know something about psychology too, <laughs> which in fact I don't. So I chose The Bluffer's Guide to Psychology. The Bluffer's Guides are a series of books which are supposed to help you to talk about a subject, even if you don't really know anything about it. So there are Bluffer's Guides to economics, to opera, to wine, all sorts of things. And what did you think? Well, I have to say, I was really impressed. It's a light-hearted introduction to psychology, which is both funny, but at the same time extremely informative and scientifically based. My feeling is that even people who really do know about psychology would find it a good read. And speaking personally, it actually made me want to find out some more about certain things like the Gestalt theory. So you'd recommend it? Absolutely. I now understand some of the terminology of psychology and a little about the main theories, but above all, I had a great time reading it. I actually laughed out loud at one point just reading one of the glossary entries. So, the Bluffer's Guide to Psychology recommended. Anita, how about you? Well, I chose a fairly recent diet book called Neris and India's Idiot Proof Diet. <laughs> I chose it firstly because Indian Night is a journalist alike and I often read her articles in the Sunday Times, which are usually very witty. Um, and also because I see myself as a bit of an expert on diet books. I mean, I've read them all and I've tried them all over the last 10 years. And your verdict? For, well... I'll just start by saying that I haven't actually done the diet yet, so I don't Obviously. know. If it, <laughs> sorry, cheeky. sorry. No, I don't know if it really works, but I thought that the book was great. Um, as Matt said about the Bluffers Guide, this book was also it was a good laugh, which is not something you can usually say about a diet book. Not right. But but for me, the two best points were that firstly. It's written by two women who were both extremely large and they did the diet themselves. Most diet books seem to be written either by men or by stick thin women who've never had a weight problem in their lives. So the fact that the authors had done the diet themselves gave it credibility for me. And then the second reason is that really more than half the book is these two women talking about um, all the reasons that made them put on weight in the first place. And I'm sure that all these psychological reasons are at the heart of most people's weight problems. So, might you give the diet a try? Uh, not that you need to, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. I might. I might, actually. I mean, the diet obviously worked for them because they're honest enough to include photos in the book of them at the fattest and, and then how they ended up after doing the diet. So, uh, Thank you, Anita. <laughs> okay. So, it's thumbs up for the idiot-proof diet. Kate, what was your choice? Uh, well, as you know, James and I recently got married, and uh, when I saw the title of this book, um, uh, it's called The Rules of Marriage, Time-Tested Secrets for Making Marriage Work, I thought, oh, that's the book for me. And uh, was it? Uh, definitely not. Uh, to tell you the truth, I was actually horrified. Ooh. The book is supposed to be a kind of manual of do's and don'ts for what to do from the engagement onwards, and... Uh, if you ask me, it was something that could have been written 50 years ago or more. Uh, the message is more or less that once you've caught your husband, you have to keep him satisfied in every possible way. And if you don't like it, then all they suggest is that you complain and moan to your girlfriends. <sighs> According to this book, making a marriage work is entirely up to the wife. The husband doesn't have to do anything at all. The wife just has to try to be exactly what her husband wants her to be and then everything will be just fine. I can't believe that in the 21st century such horrendous advice as this is being published and presumably, as it's a bestseller, being read by women in their thousands. So you wouldn't recommend the rules of marriage? <sighs> Absolutely not. In fact, I think it should be banned. So, to our last guest today... Daniel, and your book is... My book is Paul McKenna's latest, which is called I Can Make You Rich. And I don't need to give any explanations about why I chose this book. So, are we going to see you on the next list of the 100 richest people in Britain? <laughs> no, I don't think so. In fact, I feel a bit like Kate did about her book. I couldn't take it seriously at all. The book promises to help you see the world in a different way, which will make you think rich and eventually live rich. 
or through doing mental exercises which are supposed to help you find out what you want and focus on it. It has a sort of hypnosis-style CD with it, and I can't actually tell you much about it because I fell asleep after the first five minutes. <laughs> yeah, still I suppose that means it's relaxing. But after reading it, my suggestion would be, if you want to get rich, start by not wasting money on buying this book. So, a big thumbs down for Paul McKenna too. Matt, Anita, Kate and Daniel, thank you very much. 4.9 one. Well, I have quite a few friends who are into psychology. Two. I see myself as a bit of an expert on diet books. Three. According to this book, making a marriage work is entirely up to the wife. Four. The husband doesn't have to do anything at all. Five. The wife just has to try to be exactly what her husband wants her to be, and then everything will be just fine. 4.10 It's Monday. Just five minutes after I'd agreed to abandon my phone, I got a text. But of course, officially, I didn't have a mobile anymore, so I had to switch it off without reading the text. And then I spent all afternoon wondering what crucial information there was in the message. After work, I missed my train, and I'd arranged to meet my flatmate for dinner. I knew I was going to be late, and I hate being late, but there was just nothing I could do about it. I made it in time for dinner, but in the restaurant I kept feeling an urge to check my phone for messages or missed calls. It was weird and really stressful, and on top of it all, my flatmate had her phone sitting on the table in front of her. It's Tuesday. When I was on the way home, I suddenly thought that I had to ring my mother. If I'd had my phone, I'd have called her there and then, and it made me realise now that I always speak to my parents when I'm on the move. They're always complaining that we never have a conversation without traffic noise in the background. So for once, when I got home, I called her on the landline, and we had a whole half hour of conversation without any interruptions. I have to say, it was one of the most relaxing conversations we'd ever had in recent years. A real pleasure. It's Wednesday. The morning started badly because I needed to make a doctor's appointment before I went to work. But the surgery was engaged for half an hour. I eventually got through, but it meant I was late for work and I felt under pressure all day. In the evening, I'd planned to go climbing with some friends at the climbing centre, so I rushed to get home early, because one of my friends said he would need to call me to check the arrangements. I waited around for him to call, which he did, but late, so we both got to the climbing centre late and didn't enjoy it as much as we might have if we'd had more time. It's Thursday. After work, I went to a friend's house, which was about an hour away. I actually had a good feeling about being without my mobile because it meant having a whole hour for me to relax and when no one could disturb me. The feeling lasted until I got off the bus and realised that I didn't know exactly where her street was and I got completely lost looking for it. So I was late for the fourth time. It's Friday. Well, this was the day when I ended up calling the bar trying to find my friends. First, I went to the theatre with my friend Alice. I got very panicky when I was waiting for her in the foyer because we hadn't specified exactly where we were going to meet and there were a lot of people and she had the tickets. If I'd had my phone, I would have just sent her a text saying exactly where I was. Luckily, we did see each other. But then after the theatre, the idea was to meet up with some friends and that's when I ended up spending nearly five pounds what with trying to get the number of the bar from directory inquiries and then doing the whole thing again for a second bar. In the end, we went to have a drink on our own. So that wasn't just being late. It was a social occasion that just didn't happen. Four point eleven. Saturday morning. At exactly one minute past twelve, I switched my phone on again. I was really excited to see what vital or hilarious messages I'd have, 
but in fact there weren't any. But I was absolutely clear by now that the supposed benefits of living without a mobile don't really exist. The reality is that you end up waiting in the rain or being stood up or letting people down. I admit it. My name is Francesca and I am a nomophobe. And as for all the anxiety and stress that we addicts are supposed to suffer when we are deprived of our drug, the answer is simple. In the future, I will just keep my phone with me at all times and I won't turn it off again, ever. Four point twelve. Addiction, anxious, condition, crucial, obsession, officially, pressure, technician. Attachment, century, future, switched, conclusion, decision, occasion, pleasure. Arrangement, engaged, journalist, message, surgery. Four point thirteen. One. What's the question? Do I have an obsession? Every, yeah. Well, I don't consider them obsessions, but I do have a habit of organizing myself in ways that other people might consider obsessive. I've walked into. A friend's flat,、uh, where I was staying for a week or two, and instantly alphabetized their collection of CDs or DVDs of maybe a hundred or so, because if I was going to be there and I needed to find a piece of music, it just means it was a lot easier to find it when it's when it's alphabetized.、Uh, Are all your book collections and record collections at home alphabetized? Absolutely, it just saves. I do it once, and it saves a lot of time in in finding things afterwards. I find it practical. I don't find it obsessive. Two. Do you have any private obsessions? For example, you know, collecting things, exercise, tidiness,、mm. that stuff. Well, I do. I've got a complete obsession about cleaning, <laughs> and it's awful.、What? It's the bane of my life. It's absolutely awful. I cannot relax unless everything is absolutely, you know.、Um, Clean and tidy. I've had to let it go a bit because my husband's an Aussie and he's very laid back, <laughs> and、um, I just haven't been allowed to be as obsessed as I I have been in the past. And of course, having children stops the obsession a little bit because where, there's toys and stuff everywhere.、Yeah. But where did it come from? Well, um, I, I think it's just this. It's a security thing. I feel when everything's clean and tidy, I feel safe and. Comfortable, and、uh, I think it's because when I was、um, an early teenager, my parents split up; they divorced, and that's when it started. I started cleaning a. We had、um, a smoked glass coffee table with chrome legs, and I used to clean that because I couldn't stand the fingerprints on it. And that's where it began, and that then escalated, and I started cleaning the <laughs> kitchen and the bathroom. Oh my god! <clears throat> yeah. As a teenager, yeah, I was absolutely. And then Hoovering came into play, and I started Hoovering. But ironically, I've got a couple of friends, <clears throat> and their obsession with cleaning、um, started as well with the same thing. Their parents split up、um, at around about the same age, early teenagers, and they have obsessions with cleaning as well. <gasps> Um, one who I work with, not very far from here today, and another、uh, girlfriend who、um, I went on a course, met on a course, and、um, she has the same problem. So I don't know whether it's there's anything in that. Do you clean when you're upset, or do you just、yes. clean all the time when you're well, upset? Particularly when I'm upset. Yeah,、Gosh. occupies me, and everything's all nice. But I have got a handle on it now, and I'm a lot better than I used to be. <laughs> Will you come over to my place? Yes.、Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what everybody says. <laughs> Three. Well, my my mother is、um, completely pathologically addicted to checking her hair in the mirror all the time, and she's、oh. got a real hang up about her hair. Completely obsessed by it. Spends hours and hours checking out her hair, and does it interfere with her life? Well, I think it's quite time consuming. <laughs> yeah. And yes, I think it does. I mean,、oh. she can get really upset, and if she goes to the hairdresser and, and sort of has anything done, 
she she becomes really upset for days if it's slightly wrong or she's really self-conscious about just it. about her hair yeah how really long has it been going on for ever since she was a child i discovered that her brother had curly hair when he was a child beautiful curly hair yeah. and big brown eyes and i think he was the sort of favorite child i think uh, she's she the favorite one hair. she has straight hair and i think that's where it comes from mm. but she's absolutely um Is really it? hung up about it four there's a name for this condition, but I can't remember what it is, and I'm, I'm not sure what it's called, but I do count things. Um, if I come into a room, I will count the number of lights on the ceiling. The only thing is, I don't know how many there really are, because I count things so that they turn out to be in multiples of threes or nines. And I also count panes in windows. I will count panels in doors. But I like them always to get up to a 3 or a 30 or a 90. Um, so it's, it's a fairly useless thing, but it's just something I just do. Five. Yeah, my and friend no is obsessed be with health eating, absolutely obsessed. Right. And it makes going out for dinner with her um, really quite boring because you can't... you anything on the menu it, she just goes on and on about how this is bad that's bad allergy to this allergy to that um. getting the waiter over to talk <gasps> and you know about um certain things that are in in each dish and it's just so it it really actually does interfere with like her social life having fun with her because she's just completely obsessed by what she eats and it's just a bit i don't know it's a bit boring 4.14 Song Addicted to Love Peace. 
face it, you're addicted to love Might as well face it, you're addicted to love Might as well face it, you're addicted to love Four point fifteen. Part one. You've written a number of screenplays for historical dramas, for example, Rome. Why do you think there's so much demand for historical drama and film? Well, film and TV is always about good stories. I know that seems a fairly obvious thing to say, but the thing about history is it's jam-packed full with good stories, many of which people know, part, or at least vaguely know. If you say, I'm going to do a film about Robin Hood, you know that part of your audience, at the very least, will already have some knowledge of that story, and they will think, oh yeah, I quite like that story, so maybe there's something in there that, for me in that film. Um, and there are many other examples. Rome is is a you know is a canvas full of stories that have you know lasted for two thousand years. So, yeah, you know, many people have vaguely heard about Julius Caesar. Some of them know that story very very well, and so on and so on, or Caligula or whoever. So, it, history is just an endlessly useful way of telling great stories from the past in a way that means something in the present. In a perfect world, you get a double hit. You you tell a, a classic story. Um, but you also tell it in a way that makes it resonate with the present. Are historical films necessarily any more expensive than films set in the modern day? Yeah, period is always more expensive. It's just something about the fact that you have to um, you have to dress the film in a way that you don't have to dress a contemporary film. By dress, I mean not just dress people who have to wear costumes that are authentic to the period. If your film is set in 1800, they all have to look as though they were you know dressed exactly as in that period. That all costs money. But dressed also in terms of the way you make the houses look, uh, the way you make all your decorations look, your furniture, everything has to be authentic to the period. Um, you have to make sure there are no cars, no aeroplanes. Every shot has to be weighed up to make sure that you know, there's nothing in it which, which betrays the period. There's nothing more ridiculous than a period film where you see a glaring anachronism, some detail that's horribly wrong. So unfortunately, all of that costs money and you, you have to have bigger crowds in many cases. Uh, Rome was a case in point. We needed big crowds in the Senate. You have to have a, a certain number of senators. Uh, all of them have to be dressed in, you know, in togas and so on. So I'm afraid it is just an expensive way of making films, yeah. 4.16 Part 2 How important is historical accuracy in a historical film? The notion of accuracy in history is a really difficult one in drama because, you know, it's like saying, well, was Macbeth accurate? Was is Shakespeare in drama accurate? The, the, the thing is, it's not about historical accuracy. It's about whether you can make a drama work from history that means something to an audience now. So I tend to take the view that, in a way, accuracy isn't the issue when it comes to the drama. If you're writing a drama, you you have the right as a writer to create the drama that works for you so you can certainly change details the truth is nobody really knows how people spoke in rome or how people spoke in the course of charles ii or william the conqueror or victoria or whoever you have an idea you from writing from books and plays and so on we know when certain things happen what sort of dates happened i think it's really a question of judgment if you make history ridiculous if you change details to the point where history is an absurdity then obviously things become more difficult the truth is that the, the more recent history is the more difficult it is not to be authentic to it in a way it's much easier to play fast and loose with the details of what happened in rome than it is to play fast and loose with the details of what happened in the Iraq war, say, you know. So it, it, it's all a matter of perspective in some ways. Um, it, it, it's something that you have to be aware of and which you try to be faithful to, but you can't ultimately say a drama has to be bound by the rules of history because that's not what drama is. Do you think that the writer has a responsibility to represent any kind of historical truth? Not unless that's his intention. If it's your intention to be 
truthful to history and you and you put a piece out saying this is the true story of say um, the murder of Julius Caesar exactly as the historical record has it then of course that you do have an obligation because if you then deliberately tell lies about it you are you know you're deceiving your audience if however you say you're writing a drama about the assassination of Julius Caesar purely from your own perspective and entirely in a fictional context then you have the right to tell the story however you like I don't think you have any obligation except to the to the story that you're telling um, what you can't be is deliberately dishonest you can't say this is true when you know full well it isn't can you think of any examples where you feel the facts have been twisted too far <laughs> well I think the notion of whether a film a historical film has gone too far in presenting a dramatised fictional version of the truth is really a matter of personal taste. The danger is, with any historical film, that if that becomes the only thing that the audience sees on that subject, if it becomes the received version of the truth, as it were, because people don't always make the distinction between movies and reality and history, then obviously if that film is grossly... Uh, irresponsible or grossly fantastic in its in its pre presentation of the truth that could I suppose become controversial I mean if you you know I think that the only thing anybody is ever likely to know about Spartacus for example the movie is Kirk Douglas and all his friends standing up and saying I am Spartacus I am Spartacus which is a wonderful moment and it stands for the notion of freedom of individual choice and so on so Spartacus was a film made in 1962 I think if memory serves be has become, I think, for nearly everybody who knows anything about Spartacus, the only version of the truth. Now, in fact, we don't know if any of that is true, really. There are some accounts of the historical Spartacus, but very, very few. Um, and what virtually the only thing that's known about it is that there was a man called Spartacus and there was a rebellion and many people were, you know, were crucified at the end of it, as, the, as in the film. Whether that's irresponsible, I don't know. I, I can't say that I think it is. I think, in a way, it's, it's, it's a, Spartacus is a film that had a resonance in the modern era. There are other examples. You know, a lot of people uh, felt that the version of William Wallace that was presented in Braveheart was really pushing... Uh, the limits of what history could stand the whole in effect his whole career was invented in the film or at least uh, yeah um, built on to such a degree that some people felt that perhaps it was more about the notion of Scotland as an independent country than it was as about history as an authentic spectacle but you know again these things are a matter of purely personal taste I mean I enjoyed Braveheart immensely 4.17 one. You know that part of your audience, at the very least, will already have some knowledge of that story. Two. Every shot has to be weighed up to make sure that you know, there's nothing in it which, which betrays the period. Three. Rome was a case in point. We needed big crowds. Four. All of them have to be dressed in, you know, in togas and so on. Five. So I tend to take the view that, in a way, accuracy isn't the issue when it comes to the drama. Six. So it, it, it's all a matter of perspective in some ways. Seven. You can't say this is true when you know full well it isn't. 4.18. One. Tim. If you could have lived in another historical period, which period would you choose? I would have chosen the 60s and 70s because of the music of that time. I thought the musical revolution, you know, you had the Beatles coming over to America and just the music. And uh, it, was, it was a different culture at that time. I would have liked to experience that. Which historical figure do you particularly admire? Admire? Um, I'd have to say Abraham Lincoln. He was, he was pretty impactful on our, on our country. You know, uh, he had a lot of revolutionary viewpoints at, at that point in time that really put this country in a direction that I thought was pretty unique and necessary at the time. Two, Edmund. If you could have lived in another historical period, which period would you choose? I think um, probably ancient Rome, um, probably of the first, second century AD. Um, I think, uh, because I'm most interested in that sort of period, um, quite, 
quite like the idea of living in Italy. So. Which historical figure do you particularly admire? So many. Um, I suppose I've always uh, had a fondness for sort of the great generals like Alexander or Wellington or people like that, I suppose. Three. Mark. If you could have lived in another historical period, which period would you choose? Um, I think sort of uh, ancient Greece quite appeals, I have to say. Um, sort of uh, sitting around in a toga, doing lots of thinking. Um, yeah, ancient Greece. Which historical figure do you particularly admire? Um, I would say Leonardo da Vinci, um, principally because he is that archetypal Renaissance man. You know, a true polymath genius, really. Four. Amy. If you could have lived in another historical period, which period would you choose? I think it would probably be the Victorian period, um, because they always used to dress up so magnificently during the day, and I just I look around the streets nowadays and see people wearing jeans, and that seems very normal. So I think it would be very interesting to go back to a period like Victorian England when they, they dress very um, elaborately and, are, and see if that's normal and that what's casual and what's, what's well-dressed. I think that would be really interesting. So nothing historical. <laughs> Which historical figure do you particularly admire? Gosh, um, I'm not really sure. I, I do very much admire Shakespeare. That's probably a very typical answer, but... Uh, I think his writing is absolutely phenomenal and very much ahead of its time when he was writing it. So I'd say that's the most influential person I can think of. Five. Jerry. If you could have lived in another historical period, which period would you choose? I think maybe, maybe the 1950s. I wouldn't want to go very far back. I, th I think the 1950s. Why? I think it was quite a... a at least in Britain, it was quite an optimistic time. I think, I think society seemed to be progressing well and science seemed to be progressing well and there, it seemed to be a time of hope, a sort of an optimistic sort of time, unlike now, I think, where a lot of things like social developments and scientific developments seem more sort of ambivalent and unclear. I think, I think that was a good time to, 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 be, to be around. Which historical figure do you particularly admire? Um, I've just... I've just read a book about Darwin, about Charles Darwin. I, I think he was an amazing figure. I think to come up with an idea so simple and so brilliant and to, to have the courage to publish it, um, I, th I think he was an amazing chap. 4.19 1. You know, he had the Beatles coming over to America. 2. Um, quite quite like the idea of living in Italy. So. Three. Sort of uh, sitting around in a toga, doing lots of thinking. Four. I think his writing's absolutely phenomenal and very much ahead of its time. Five. I think to come up with an idea so simple and so brilliant.